Would you pray with me a moment? Open my lips that my mouth might show forth your praise. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So here we are. Another Sunday, more really good news, with yet another preposterous Jesus story. Preposterous because it's so far out of our realm of expectation. But good news, which we'll get to, that if we can give it a try, it will set us free from the forces that enslave us. It will help us be able to bring God's kingdom on earth. And as I've already alluded, it comes in the strangest possible package. A story about a corrupt manager who works for a rich man. Now, that itself is instantly recognizable. All of the Galilean peasants that Jesus would have been talking to, the disciples, would have recognized that character. They all worked for those characters. They were peasant farmers, and they had to turn over huge amounts of their produce every year and pay. And we know these guys, too. Just open up the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Boston Globe. There's another one caught all the time. MBTA, you name it. Now, this corrupt manager has been squandering his boss's property. The verb is the same one for the sower and the seeds. He's strewing it about. He's scattering it. Sounds about right. Now, the rich man as you remember, calls him to account. What's this I hear about you wasting my property? Open the books so I can see for myself, you are out. Now, the original audience of Galilean peasants would have been surprised because they lived in an unfair world and the peasants who they were were squeezed for every ounce of grain, but not the bosses. But on the other hand, they would have been fulfilled, their expectations would have been fulfilled because they understand or they would have intuited that Jesus was talking about the judgment, about God. And they thought, that's right. This guy is going to get what's coming to him. God will put things right. You and I, from a very different world, we might be thinking, what does this have to do with us? And God. This is nothing like the God we imagine. What's the, co connect? What's the connection with corrupt business practices? And why is he mixing with unsavory characters like the manager? But then the story turns. The manager shows his wisdom. This is a parable called the parable of the shrewd manager, after all. It's not called the parable of the corrupt manager. It shows how he got his job in the first place. He thinks quickly on his feet. He doesn't want to work as a laborer after having been a white collar criminal for all this time. And he's ashamed to become a beggar. So he does what he has to do. And he cuts a deal. He rationalizes, I'm fired. My master's throwing me out. I have to do something. I'll turn to the people that owe my master money and figure out a way to get welcomed into their homes. Because of course, every time before that, that he'd gone into their homes, it was to collect, to collect debts. So he wasn't really welcome, but they couldn't say no. But now it will be out of genuine affection. Now, to us, this may sound like corruption, like he's cutting a shady deal, but it is the linchpin of the story, the kernel of the spiritual wisdom that Jesus offers us. But before we get to the wisdom, we discover that this is big business we're talking about, not small potatoes. These are huge, seemingly unforgivable loans or debts. I looked it up. Eight jugs of olive oil is 800 gallons, worth about a thousand denarii or three years wages. So this first debtor is into the rich man for a lot of money. And the manager rewrites the debt down to 500. No authority, he just does it. Imagine that. 
Or the thousand bushels of wheat? Thousand bushels of wheat. That's worth 2,500 denarii or eight years wages. And just like that, he writes it down to 800. Now at this moment in the story, because we're not farmers, we may not think much, but the Galilean audience's mind are blown. It's as if, just like that, he's writing off the value of an entire village's work for a year. How can he cut such a deal? We'd never get this kind of break. But then we join in the story as listeners and we think, would we give anyone that kind of break if they owned us that kind of money? Maybe we're thinking, okay, but it's unfair. That's so unfair. How does this connect us to God? And it doesn't as long as we're thinking in terms of fair and unfair. And that's where the rich man comes back into the story. He commends the dishonest manager for acting shrewdly. And you can imagine the original audience. What? What do you mean he commends him? How can the master allow the manager to get away with that? What about judgment day? How come he's not getting punished? Why aren't his feet being held to the fire? And that's not a metaphor like his feet actually being held to the fire. Why isn't he beaten or even killed or at least imprisoned or enslaved to pay off his debt? All could have happened back then. Or if you're like me, and I confess before I read, for the last 25 years, I've been scratching my head about this. Except the answer is pure Jesus genius. And it's this. Life. Our lives, since the beginning of time, everyone's life, is not some sort of euphoric utopia. Really real life is full of messiness, of corruption and dishonesty, of offenses and trespasses and the kid across the street making fun of you and debts and injustices and outrages and injuries and irreparable harms and things that just shouldn't be that way, but they are. And if you're a normal human being, we go through life thinking to ourselves all the time, that shouldn't be that way. He shouldn't have gotten away with that. She shouldn't have done that. This ought not to be allowed. I wish I hadn't done that. Why is this happening to me? In this story, Jesus means for us to understand that we are the manager, not the debtors, not the rich men, but the manager. And you and I, as people of God, are not called to think that we can fix everything that has been done wrong in the world up to this state. We cannot undo the past. But we can transform it into the future. We can change it. We can reconcile so that a future is possible. In short, we're called to write it off. We say it all the time, to be ministers of reconciliation and forgiveness as the stewards of the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I know, that's preposterous. I could, as a New England Yankee, I could not get my mind around writing it off, right? There's right and there's wrong. You've got to do right or you've got to make other people be right. How can we just let it go? No consequences. What about right and wrong? The moral order of the universe will unravel. And what about my injuries? The things that have happened to me? I deserve them to be made right. Except you can't fix the past. The past is done. Think about it. If you like movies, besides romantic comedies, what's the most popular movie theme out there? Revenge, 
right? It's all about people getting what's coming to them. And we love it. People cheer when the person who's been put down finds out a way to get the bad guy back. So we clearly resonate with this. Maybe you in your life have had times where your heart has literally been burning with a desire for revenge. Or you want retribution so that things are even and fair. Or maybe it didn't work out and so you put up walls in your life and, and you just cut people off. You're dead to me, you're dead to me, you're dead to me. Or maybe you have a gnawing sense of shame, like me, for slugging that kid, even though he had it coming. I still don't feel good about it. Things that were never put right. I was never able to be that boy's friend. Maybe you live with a sense, it's just not fair. This shouldn't have happened to me. Whatever it is, though, that keeps you stuck. What Jesus says is you have to rewrite the bill to something that can be done. Right? They could pay the 80. They could pay the 50. They just couldn't pay the 100. If we can truly imagine what Jesus is saying to us, it really is good news. This, my friends, is what is called pragmatic and creative spirituality. Like I told the children, we have to figure out what our solution is. It's not about floating around in the clouds with Jesus waiting for heaven, but making hard choices in life. What can I let go of from the past so that I can blossom in the future? And then once you and I practice with each other, with our brothers and sisters, with our cousins and aunts and uncles and parents, and our children, and our neighbors and the folks in the pews beside us, then we're called to start doing it with our community, and our country, and our world, and our enemies. We are supposed to try to cut through all the anger and resistance we feel about past wrongs. You're all old enough to remember Nelson Mandela in jail for 28 years. He was a revolutionary. 28 years, he came out and he wrote it off. No bitterness. He made friends with his people who imprisoned him for all that time. Was over apartheid, but nonetheless he did it. There are people who I've read about who survived the Holocaust and were able to forgive and move on and not be stuck. It seems so enormous that it seems preposterous. But if you think about it, Jesus is showing us the way forward. May it be so for you. Amen.